My name is Mark McGowan, and I'm a professor of history at the University of Toronto, and I teach in the Celtic Studies program at St. Michael's College in that same institution. Um, I'm here uh, in what I call my hobbit hole, my home office uh, in Whitby, Ontario, in isolation, uh, furthering my research and teaching online. But as I've been doing that, and because my area of research is the Great Irish Famine of the mid-19th century, um, the COVID-19 uh, crisis that we now face in Canada and globally has recalled many parallels to uh, what happened uh, in British North America uh, and in the rest of the world in the 1840s. Now, the story really begins, as we reflect, uh, in Ireland in the 1840s, which was experiencing a monumental catastrophe, and that was the failure of the potato crop across Ireland uh, in 1846, and then the need for uh, many Irish to leave, uh, lest they be starved or die of infectious disease, particularly by 1847, which became known as Black 47. And in that sailing season, over 100,000 Irish decided to embark to the British North American colonies, uh, about 90,000 to Quebec, about 17,000 to New Brunswick, and a few thousand to the other uh, Atlantic colonies, and about 119,000 uh, decided to go to the United States. One of the problems is, is they boarded uh, ships that were not fit uh, for long-term human passage. They were essentially cargo ships that uh, human beings, the passengers, uh, became essentially ballast on the return trip uh, to North America. Uh, on board those ships for the six to eight week voyage, uh, many of these people began to suffer from an infectious disease called, in those days, ship's fever, but we call typhus now. Uh, they became infected by a rickettsia bacteria. Um, and the tragic thing about this particular disease is that you infect yourself. Um, uh, lice inhabited these ships, and when a louse bit you uh, with the intent to suck your blood, it also defecated in the wound, and its feces contained the bacteria. Um, when you were itchy from that bite, you scratched, and you essentially allowed the rickettsia into your system. Now, one of the things that is quite, uh, actually say, complementary to today is the way in which many people did not show signs or symptoms of this disease for 10 to 12 days. And so those who looked perfectly healthy upon landing, even at the quarantine stations at Partridge Island near St. John, New Brunswick, or Gros Ile, uh, close to Quebec City, uh, were moved on very quickly. Um, those who did show signs of the disease, who were fuzzy in thought, who were raging in fever, had uh, grave abdominal distress, uh, and skin lesions were kept on the quarantine islands, and over 5,000 in 1847 died of Grossil alone. But the problem was is that those who looked healthy, who didn't appear to have those symptoms, moved on to Quebec City, to Montreal, to Bytown, now Ottawa, to, uh, to Kingston, uh, and to Toronto. And Toronto is an interesting case study because Toronto was a very small uh, colonial city, less than 20,000 people, and over 38,000 migrants landed in the sailing season between June uh, and November of 1847. So a massive influx of people, some of whom were ill and some of whom uh, had no symptoms. Uh, many of these were moved on by Edward McElderry, who was the uh, um, the assistant agent uh, of emigration moved on to places like Niagara, uh, to the United States, to Hamilton, to Branford, to points west. But many of those who showed signs and symptoms of, of illness were transferred to what was called then the Toronto General Hospital, then specifically for emigrants. And over 1,124 people died. But it was at that hospital and the sheds that were built at King and John Street, now the site of the Toronto International Film Festival, is where we really see first responders, doctors, nurses, orderlies, uh, maintenance personnel, and clergy, Catholic and Protestant, put their lives on the line. Um, the chief physician, uh, George Rousset, actually dies in July of 1847 of typhus. Then the Catholic Bishop of Toronto, not quite 43 years old, is the only priest left in the diocese to serve uh, in the city at that point. 
He contracts typhus and dies on October 1st. Many call him a martyr to charity. And when you think of these inspirational stories of first responders back in 1847, here in Toronto and elsewhere in Montreal and at Grosseil, um, you can't help but be inspired by those today, doctors, nurses, and others who are putting their lives on the line every day to keep the supply chains going, uh, to heal the sick, and to comfort those who are dying. So there's much that we can learn from our history, uh, and certainly the typhus epidemic of 1847 calls to mind many similarities to what we're enduring today.